Okay. Uh, so thanks everybody for, for making it out to the first, first meeting of our, our seminar. Um, before we get started, I want to say if anybody wants to give a talk or has recommendations for people for me to send emails out, please, please reach out. I don't want to start pressuring the people who are here yet to talk as I've got a, a good bit of people lined up. The next two or three weeks are settled. Um, but if you have any recommendations for people for me to, to email, please um, send them my way. Um, okay. So today we have Josh Cooper continuing um, his lectures on the, the Brouwer conjecture. Uh, I don't think a round of applause is a good thing to start or something. I don't know, it'd be kind of weird. So I guess, Josh, go ahead and just take us away. Thank you, thank you, Drew. Um, well, thanks everybody for joining. This is, yeah, I'm kind of excited to see how this pans out. Um, this is a, a new day in the, the street seminar that you can attend no matter where you are on the planet. Um, should be interesting. It looks like I mean, we've got quite a crowd today. I mean, it seems like many attendees, 15. Pretty good. Um, so, um, uh, yeah, so I, I'm going to talk about uh, <clears throat> some not, not so recent anymore, fairly recent uh, results around uh, what's known as the Brouwer conjecture, which in some circles is. Uh, considered important. Um, I think it's a very interesting question. And um, uh, because I, this is a talk that uh, is really, it's the, I think it's the third talk in a series that I gave last semester, two other talks um, on, the, on this topic. Um, I'm, I'm going to do a brief overview, maybe not, not even so brief overview of kind of the the, the context here, the, the questions being asked, uh, what's known, et cetera, um, before getting to the, the piece of the, uh, the story that I wanted to talk about today. Um, and I, because it's the first week of classes and everything is nuts, I'm just, uh, this is going to be a blackboard talk, um, meaning a whiteboard talk <laughs> over Zoom. Uh, so let's see, can I share my whiteboard here? Um, Is that, everybody see that okay? Yeah, looks good to me. Great. All right, so yeah, this is, uh, I'm gonna talk about Brower's conjecture. Um, and this is um, uh, actually appeared first um, in Brower's book with Hamers, with William Hamers um, from 2012. Uh, although uh, it's funny, you can actually find some a few papers in the preceding year or two on the topic because it was already being discussed um, and being called Brower's conjecture. Um, and uh, by the way, everything I talk about today is uh, uh, it's basically in this manuscript that I'm currently being refereed, but uh, uh, is uh, is visible in the archive at uh, its number this you know, uh, want to follow up on anything. Um, this is the number of archive.org. Um, so yeah, the idea here, so this is a this is a conjecture about the properties of the Laplacian eigenvalues of a graph. An ordinary, simple, undirected, no groups graph. Um, so uh, it's funny how little is known about full plus and eigenvalues. Uh, and, and this is one of these questions that well, you'll see. It sort of looks weird initially, but then you'll see where it's coming from. Um, so let me define suppose you have G is just a simple, undirected graph. And um, I want to define a few associated uh, matrices the game and the spectral graph theory that you have your graph and you associate some your favorite kind of matrix with it and you study the spectral properties of the matrix and relate it back to the properties of the graph. So this is the adjacency matrix A of G. Um, and there of course the idea is that the uh, the rows and columns are indexed by uh, by the vertices of the graph 
And the entry in the matrix is one if the corresponding row and column are adjacent in the graph and zero otherwise. It's a, a very standard way of, uh, of encoding matrices for computations, um, but also for various theoretical purposes. Also learn to find D of G. This is the diagonal uh, degree matrix. Um, and it's just the, the diagonal matrix you get by putting the degrees on the, uh, think of the degree vector of the graph, put those on the diagonal and zeros everywhere else. Uh, that gives the diagonal degree matrix. The only thing that you gotta be careful of is that the, um, the adjacency matrix and the degree matrix have their rows and columns indexed the same way. So that we can use a consistent labeling for the rows and columns. Um, that's A and D, and then L of G is just D of G minus A of G. Um, and uh, uh, this is the Laplacian matrix of G. Um, and uh, actually there's, there's a couple of different Laplacians out there. Um, the sometimes called San Diego Laplacian, normalized Laplacian. Um, or to you to, to Fan Chung. Um, but uh, there's also the, sometimes people call this one the, the combinatorial Laplacian, and it actually just differs by a similarity transformation from the normal, normalized Laplacian. But uh, it's uh, in, combinatorially the simplest, although um, sometimes not the best version of Laplacian you use depending on what sort of application you have in mind. Um, so this is the, the combinatorial Laplacian. And of course, it's a real symmetric matrix. And so its eigenvalues are real. Right? And um, so we can, we can number them. Let's lambda one is the biggest maybe, and then lambda two, and then, well, there's gonna be N of them, right? Because it's an N by N matrix. And so there are N eigenvalues, often called Laplacian eigenvalues. And um, the, um, uh, some things are known about these, these lambdas. Um, so for example, uh, these things will be, be important. Lambda one, the biggest one is always at most N and lambda N is always zero actually. The reason for that is that you might say, okay, well, so where's the zero eigenvalue coming from? It means that there must be something in the null space of L of G. Well, it's the all ones vector. Think about it for a minute. Uh, adding up the rows of the adjacency matrix gives you the degree. And so multiplying L of G by the all ones vector gives you the zero vector. So that's where that's coming from. And in fact, there's this well-known property that the number of zeros, the multiplicity of zero as an eigenvalue is equal to the number of components of the graph. So if you have a connected graph, you only get one eigenvalue at the very end is zero, but if it's disconnected, there are more zeros that occur at the end of this list of eigenvalues, these lots of eigenvalues. Um, okay, so those are the, uh, just some, some basic properties of the Laplacian. Uh, let me state the Brouwer conjecture and then talk a little bit about where this is coming from. So Brouwer's conjecture says, and It says that uh, for any E graph, uh, and these Laplacian eigenvalues, the sum of the K largest eigenvalues is bounded by the number of edges plus A plus one choose two. This is a weird statement for a lot of reasons. Um, you may not see the motiv motivation immediately. Um, I certainly didn't. And uh, the reason for, for the, just, just one, of, one of the sort of weird aspects of this is that uh, in addition to this being highly inhomogeneous and falling uh, out of nowhere, uh, the left-hand side of this expression is adding up a decreasing sequence, which means that if you plot them, you get something that's concave down. 
if I'm starting lambda one and then when you imagine plotting, then you get something like this calculate down in, in K. So K is ranging from zero up to N and uh, <clears throat> I guess you start at zero. And you get some concave down expression because the lambdas are decreasing. Now, of course, this is not always exactly what happens because you can have uh, lots of lambdas that are equal. And so there's, there's flat parts of the curve and things like that. But generally speaking, this, because they're decreasing, they are, uh, well, not flat, they're, they're, well, they are flat in the sense of being uh, aligned. Um, uh, because the, these lambdas are decreasing, we, we just order them that way. The, uh, the sum of them is concave down. And this is one way of saying that the sequence of chi fan uh, norms of your Laplacian are concave down because actually the sum is the, um, these are the, the, the kth chi fan norms of your matrix L of G is the measure of of the, and then parentheses k. Um, chi fan norm, actually not even obvious that it should be a norm, but it's the sum of the, the k largest uh, uh, singular values, which in this case just correspond to the eigenvalues. In particular, these are, these all these eigenvalues are non-negative right? and real. So that's the left-hand side, it's concave down. The right-hand side is it's concave up and doesn't even start at zero, right? It's inhomogeneous. So you start at you know, E of G, number of edges, which I'll, I'll often just call that M. And then you've got something that is a parabola up in K. It's concave up in K. And so <laughs> the fact that the left-hand side is at most the right-hand side is sort of a strange fact. Um, you might wonder where's the, uh, what kinds of graphs do these two curves meet? And I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, but I uh, just want to get this picture in your, in your mind. Uh, so just to point out, uh, there are some uh, easy observations you can make right away about when this holds. Let me call this condition E, C, K of G, so for our conjecture, eighth version by G. Uh, so when k is zero, it's trivial. So the sum is empty. When k is one, you just get lambda one. And we already said lambda one is less than or equal to n. And so, uh, well, on the right-hand side, uh, you also get something that, well, the number of edges is at most, uh, sorry, is at least n minus one, because we can assume that g is connected because it's easy to show that if Brouwer's conjecture is true uh, for some graphs, then it's true for their uh, disjoint union, essentially because of the convexity of the function k plus one choose two. So we only have to really consider connected graphs in order to, to prove Brouwer's conjecture or special cases of it. And, uh, and so we can assume the graph is connected, which means it's got already a tree in it, which means it's got at least n minus one edges, which means this M right here has is at least n minus one. Assume that, and well, then the second sum and is then one, right? And so when k is one, so the sum of those is n. So the left hand side is certainly bounded above by the right hand side. Uh, with quite a bit more work, uh, Brower and some co-authors showed that this is true always also for k equals two. Um, and then also uh, something that I am not going to prove today, actually, I think I did it in the first lecture in this, this three-part series, um, thus far three-part series, uh, that, uh, uh, that if it's true for K, that it's, it's not hard to show that if BCK is, is always true, then uh, that implies that BC n minus one minus k also, uh, it's also true there. And it's by complementing the underlying graph as you might expect. So the idea is that if it's true for uh, k equals one and k equals two, like I just said, so it's true for k equals one and it's true for k equals two, well, then it's also true for k equals n minus two and n minus one. Um, and, uh, and that just follows from the of 
for our elements and this this complementation property that you can, that, that you can always flip uh, the subscript here uh, with respect to n minus one. So uh, that's a few of the things that we know about this. Uh, like I said, that comes from complementation. Uh, we also know that uh, ECKG is true when uh, G is a threshold graph. Actually, there's a number of characterizations of threshold graphs. Uh, one of them is that you're starting from uh, a single vertex, and then you're allowed to take disjoint unions and complements. Um, that's one way to do it. Uh, another way to do it, especially why it's called the threshold graph, is you could just define G to be uh, you have a, a vertex set V, and then uh, we have a function from the vertices to the reals, and we're going to put an edge into the edge set of, of G, uh, let's say X, Y, whenever F of X plus F of Y is uh, greater than or equal to some alpha that we've also chosen in advance. Um, so if you can, you get a class of graphs this way, they're called threshold graphs. It turns out, uh, so very easy to show that threshold graphs are, um, are uh, they satisfy the, the Brouwer conjecture. And in fact, they're tight. So you can hit the bound for any K for, you can always construct a threshold graph that hits that bound. And so that's one, one reason for believing this conjecture is that that's an upper bound for threshold graphs and threshold graphs are sort of widely believed to have the largest of these, uh, the sums of eigenvalues, um, these chi fan norms of the Laplacian. And actually there's a larger class of graphs called split graphs where these contain the threshold graphs. Uh, these also, uh, it's known by uh, the master's thesis of Mayock, actually, that the Brouwer conjecture is true for split graphs. Split graphs are graphs where you can split it into some complete graph and a complement to the complete graph. So it looks like a complete graph on one side of the split and a, an independent set on the other side of the split, and then something in between. So anything in between is fine. That still counts as a split graph, no matter what is chosen to be the edges in between. Threshold graphs have this structure. Notice you can, what is the split for a threshold graph? It's you take all the vertices whose value, according to F, is greater than or equal to alpha over two. Those all have they're all adjacent to each other because, of course, the sum of any two of them is at least alpha. On the other side, in the independent set, if f of x and f of y are both less than alpha, then their sum, sorry, alpha over two, then their sum is less than alpha. So those don't have any edges. And then things in between, okay, they, they may or may not have edges. Um, so, yeah, so that's the threshold graphs are also split, and those are known to satisfy the Brouwer conjecture. Um, we also know things like uh, if you have at most 10 vertices, it's true. Actually, I was able to extend this using some of the results in this, this manuscript to uh, 11 now. Um, so all of the graphs on 11 or fewer vertices satisfy the Brouwer conjecture. And um, by the way, if you're interested uh, in research topic that is probably just a matter of putting in some work and not too much luck involved. You probably get it to 12 without too much, breaking too much of a sweat. Uh, you just have to be more efficient with the computation. I wasn't overly careful with the efficiency of the algorithms. Um, did it in Sage. So uh, we also know this, the Brouwer conjecture is true for trees and forests. Forests, I already mentioned. Once you know, for some graphs, you know they're just right union. Um, and um, it's also known for uh, regular graphs and random graphs, um, and also things like unicyclic 
graphs and bicyclic graphs, and just have one cycle and two cycles known for those. Um, I discussed in the previous uh, talks about this this uh, Brouwer conjecture and some of some of the results around it. Um, I'm able to show that uh, if k is at least four times the the arboricity minus one, um, then it's true. And so, in particular, uh, k greater than eleven, constant eleven for planar graphs. And um, let's see, I'm also able to show that if uh, k is at least, remember k is varying from one up to n, right? So if k is at least uh, the square root of 32n um, for g bipartite. So it's true for almost all the k's, just uh, maybe a few at the beginning. Uh, not true. But, well, we think it is true, but I can show that for at least uh, once you get past root 32n uh, for bipartite. Actually, it, it's not important that it be bipartite. It just has to belong to a hereditary class uh, with some forbidden subgraphs, basically. Uh, the graphs where the, the classes of graphs for which the uh, induced subgraphs belong to the class as well. Uh, once that happens, you get a class of graphs where something like this occurs. Um, essentially, it just changes the constants. Uh, also, uh, same thing for bipartite graphs. I'm just using bipartite as a most natural example. If the number of edges is at least square root of 32 and of the three halves, then also hold for bipartite graphs. Um, and uh, just to point out, right, like the number of edges could be as much as quadratic. And so this is saying it's it's anything more than very sparse. So end of the three halves is pretty, pretty sparse graph. Um, if you have a bipartite graph that's reasonably dense, then, then Brower holds. Um, also, uh, I'm able to show that if the uh, variance of the degree sequence, I'll tell you exactly what I mean by that in a second, um, is at most, and actually, it's not quite, there's a little pickup here. It's not quite that. It's almost that. Um, so uh, the variance, the degree sequence, I, I just mean, you know, think of them as samples and, and take the, the, um, the variance of that, of that set of samples. Or if you like, it's the, you take a random variable, which, uh, so uniformly a random pickup vertex of the graph, and then output its degree, the variance of that random variable. Is, uh, is what I do here. And so on the right hand side, uh, you know, the variance in general is going to be order n squared. So this is uh, beta, um, beta is, um, this is just the edge density. So m over n choose two. It's the fraction of possible edges, which actually are edges. Um, remember, m always means the number of edges in our graph. So um, if the variance is not very high, uh, then uh, then Brouwer holds. And so this, by the way, this implies the result about regular graphs because there the variance is zero. Uh, also implies it uh, for erdos rainy random graphs because the variance of those sequences is much smaller. It's linear instead of quadratic. Uh, right? The degrees are highly concentrated. And so, yeah, so it, it also graphs where the max degree and the min degree are not far apart, uh, things like that. This implies it has a bunch of corollaries with lots of different kinds of graphs. Um, and uh, uh, all right, so that, that's another one of our results. And um, another case where the Brouwer conjecture I can show it's true is when um, the splittance, which is often written sigma, I'll tell you what split is in a second, is at least end of the three halves over root two. Um, the split of a graph is the edit distance to the class of split graphs. So this is the minimum number of edges that you have to flip 
from, well, from edges to non-edges or from non-edges to edges um, uh, in order to make your graph split. So the split, that's the splittings of a graph. And um, it, as long as it's at least end of the three halves over two, in other words, you're reasonably far from being a split graph, then, uh, then the conjecture holds. So it's only graphs that are very close to being split that, uh, that we don't know the conjecture for. Um, it can also show uh, with a slightly different flavor that this, remember we're comparing the sum of the first J eigenvalues to this question is this at most this quantity. Um, if um, so in, in complete generality uh, for any G, the uh, left hand side minus the right hand side. It should be always not uh, non-positive, right? That's the conjecture that left hand side minus right hand side is non-positive. Um, but I can show this is uh, uh, it's certainly never bigger than some constant times n to the five fourths, I think. Uh, where again, the both sides could be quadratic, so that's pretty small compared to n squared. Um, or uh, bipartite G again, like it's not. It's just that it belongs to a hereditary class, but for bipartite G. Uh, same thing, left hand side minus right hand side. Uh, I can show it's it's the most linearly um, off from the conjecture. So we're always even in the case where you're very close to the splittings and all those other conditions fail. Uh, still, the violation of the conjecture is, uh, is at most um, end of the five fourths and it's bipartite n. Um, and uh, finally, uh, I can show that uh, for any g. Um, the, uh, the set of Ks so that, you know, uh, the PC for our conjecture fails for, for G is uh, contained in an interval. Remember the Ks are, they vary from zero up to N or one up to N contained in an interval, uh, so it holds everywhere except a short interval, namely one that has length at most end of the three fourths. So we're comparing the n possibilities, right? K varies from zero up to n or one up to n, and uh, can show that, well, in general, it, it, uh, uh, it's true everywhere, but at most for end of the three fourths values of K and uh, and they actually fall in an interval. Actually, you can kind of see how you prove that from a picture, that picture I drew previously. You consider this, and how could a, you know, a, a downward, uh, concave down uh, curve, how could that go above this concave up curve, um, but not exceed the, the value by very much? Right? So this is basically taking these facts and then noting that if you're going to not exceed the, uh, the this this upper curve by at most you know n or n to the five fourths, well you have to kind of turn around immediately after you cross the curve. You can't go too far, and so the interval where you pass it's an interval where you could potentially pass the, uh, the Brouwer conjecture. Um, it's it's at most length end of the three fourths. It's only a very short interval when that could even happen. And it's, it's really just because the two curves are, one of them's concave up, the other one's concave down. Um, so yeah, that's uh, just, just uh, some different results give you a feel for uh, what's known about this. And uh, uh, something to note is that there's, a, there's another matrix associated with graphs that doesn't come up as often and isn't as highly studied, but it's definitely of interest to uh, lots of lots of areas. Um, it's this unsigned Laplacian. So this is it look, it'll look almost the same. It's not the degree matrix minus the adjacency matrix because you know degrees on the diagonal and minus ones everywhere. There's an edge. It's instead plus. So now you've got 
ones everywhere there's a, an ID instead of minus ones. Uh, it's conjectured that the same statement Uh, is true there <clears throat> for for the but now instead of the lambdas being the, the Laplacian eigenvalues or the signless Laplacian eigenvalues, even less is known about the signless Laplacian eigenvalues. So it's conjectured this is true, and uh, Vladimir Kiferov had an interesting thought. Um, there's a way to kind of interpolate between the uh, signless Laplacian and the uh, and the unsigned Laplacian, namely, what if we flip edges from pluses to minuses one at a time? So what I want to do is I'm going to define a signed graph. Right, so a signed graph is it's a pair G and tau. Um, tau takes the edge set to just plus minus one. So we're going to give a sign to each edge. The degree matrix is what you think it is. It's just the usual uh, diagonal of the degree sequence of G. Uh, and the adjacency matrix, though, is now, uh, it's really, I want to write this, G super tau. I mean, this pair. So it's the, you've signed G. So A of G tau, this means the matrix, which is, okay, let me just tell you for a given pair of BW of vertices, it's, uh, well, it's just tau of BW if BW is an edge, and it's, uh, it's zero otherwise. And then we'll define the signed Laplacian of tau to be this you know, D of G minus A of G tau. So, uh, right, so the idea is that if, if tau assigns all ones to the edges, this is just the ordinary Laplacian. If it sign, assigns minus ones to all the edges, then it's uh, the unsigned Laplacian. And so by considering all the signed graphs, you're kind of interpolating between these two regimes, the, the unsigned Laplacian and the signed Laplacian. Um, so, natural question, if you think that the Brouwer conjecture is true for Laplacians and you think it's true, the analog of it is true for the sinus Laplacian, well, then maybe it's true all the way in between. And uh, uh, Nikiforov uh, started looking at examples and very quickly found a graph with, I think it's five vertices and six edges which violates the conjecture. So uh, he found a small graph with the property, a small signed graph with the property that the left-hand side, the sum of the uh, signed Laplacian eigenvalues exceeds the right-hand side, the m plus k plus one plus two. And, uh, <clears throat> and so I was wondering, you know, is this, uh, is this a common phenomenon or maybe this is only true for a sm very small graphs, you know, only graphs with most eight vertices, and then it's true forevermore that DC is true of all of the signed graphs. Uh, so no, it turns out it's it's usually false. Uh, it was kind of a shock. I expected it to be true at one end, true at the other. It's probably true in between, but nope. Uh, so theorem. Uh, this is again in that archive paper, um, and uh, it just says that. Uh, uh, one way to say it is that the Brouwer conjecture for G, not just G, it's a uh, complete graph, a signed complete graph uh, is false for almost all tau. So actually what I mean is asymptotically almost surely, right? So namely, as n tends to infinity, the probability that the Brouwer conjecture fails tends to one. That's what this asymptotically almost really means. That right? That once you once you make n big enough, you can make the probability of failure get as close to one as you like. So it usually fails. This uh, Brouwer conjecture is usually not true of uh, signed graphs, um, which is somewhat surprising. 
And uh, just to kind of give you a little picture of what's going on here, if you think about what does Browder say about the, the complete graph? So the complete graph is a split graph and a threshold graph. And so it's, it's uh, certainly true there, Browder conjecture is true. What does this look like? Well, on the left-hand side, right, there's a sum, J goes from one to N of lambda J. Uh, and then on the right-hand side, and then on the right-hand side, you get a uh, number of edges plus k plus one choose two. Well, number of edges is n choose two, and this goes up to k plus one choose two. And uh, on the left-hand side, what is that? Well, it's not hard to see that the Laplacian eigenvalues of a complete graph are, so these are the number two, et cetera, down to lambda, N minus one and the n that these are all equal to n minus one and then of course that's zero uh, which means that the left hand side here until you get to k equals n which we already know the Brouwer conjecture true of all graphs there trivial basically uh, that this is uh, uh, equal to k minus k times n minus one on the left hand side. And so what do these two curves look like? You know, if you think about K going from, I'm gonna keep drawing this graph where we're going from, K is going from zero up to N. So uh, this, the, the, the right-hand side, right, starts at about N squared over two, right, N choose two. And then it goes up to, well, when K is, uh, is N, it's, n plus one choose two uh, is basically n squared over two again. And so the sum of them is n squared. So if you think of this as going up to n squared, the upper bound looks like this. That's, that's the upper bound. And then this quantity, the left-hand side, lower bound, well, that's just a line of slope n minus one. And actually, <coughs> when k is, uh, <coughs> When k is uh, n minus one, these meet. So you get this line that basically hits it right at the end, but uh, it's a little, the last value it does. Um, I really can't see what I'm trying to do there. Uh, ah, and I want it to go over the curve. There we go. And then there's a little, the last value it doesn't matter. But uh, uh, it actually meets it. Uh, you can tell my drawing, but they meet it there. And uh, these are threshold graphs. They meet the, the Brouwer bound. It looks like that, right? That's the left-hand side, certainly less than the right-hand side. So you can imagine uh, what's going to happen as we add the signings to uh, our, our complete graph, KN. We're going to perturb this red line somehow. And the, the question is, what does that perturbation look like? And if you pin it down, you'll see actually it, it, it makes the, the red curve go over the blue curve, um, goes above it. Only very, very slightly. It turns out it's, it's pretty delicate, actually. It took me a couple of days of sitting and just playing with the calculations to get this right. Really fine, fine detail in the calculation. Um, it's, it's really in the lower order terms that this happens. I'm going to try to convince you of this today, although uh, I'm not going to do all the details. There's lots of nasty, rigorous details if you want to really write them out. Um, essentially, yeah, there's a bunch of integrals, and kind, of, kind of messy things that happen, but uh, the story I'm about to tell you can make rigorous. And like I said, the details are in that the, the script that I told you earlier in that lecture. Um, all right, so why, what, what's the idea here? Um, if you think about it, right, the Laplacian of the signed complete graph what, what does this look like? Well, the Laplacian of the complete graph is you've got what? Ends on the diagonal, um, n minus ones on the diagonal, n minus ones on the diagonal. And so take the identity matrix times n minus one, and then, uh, and then we're going to subtract the all ones 
matrix is often represented J. So actually, in order to get this to work, I did want N there. Right, it's N times the identity matrix minus this, uh, uh, this J matrix, the all ones matrix is all ones. We can use J for that. Um, N by N all ones matrix. So right, that's the that's the ordinary Laplace. And what happens when you when you give it the signing? Well, the degrees don't change, so the first term doesn't change. The second term is going to change, though. Um, so it's instead you get n times i n, and then okay, you're gonna you're gonna be adding and subtracting some kind of uh, symmetric plus minus one matrix, right? So it turns out that it's root n times m, where m is an IID symmetric matrix with entries uh, plus minus one over root n. Right, that'll give you your, your pluses and minus ones when you multiply. Um, IID symmetry, I, well, all I mean is that you choose all of the entries above, strictly above the diagonal, uh, independently and identically, just, just uniformly 50 50 flip a coin, uh, assign these one of these two values according to the outcome of the coin, and then copy all those values into the, the lower triangular part of the matrix as well. That's M. Um, and so this is a, an expression for the Laplacian of that matrix of the, the signed uh, uh, the signed complete graph. And the reason to write it this way is that the spectrum of n is well under, of m is well understood. And in fact, by this relation, you get that the kth Laplacian eigenvalue of the signed Laplacian is they're in bijection with the eigenvalues of M. It's just this. Let me take a let's take an eigenvalue of M and let's call it nu k. Take an eigenvalue of M and multiply it by root n and then add n to it, you get an eigenvalue of the signed Laplacian. Um, and okay, well, again. The matrix M is real symmetric, and so the eigenvalues uh, can be ordered um, thusly. And like I said, it's actually very well understood what these nus look like, what the eigenvalues of a random uh, symmetric matrix look like. Uh, there's a, a very famous result known as Wigner's semicircle law. It says what the news look like. Now, keep in mind, M is a random matrix, right? So these, these news are also random. Uh, so we can only describe their probability distribution. It turns out that the, the PDF of the eigenvalues, um, news is it's a semicircle what it's called semicircle law it's one over two pi times the square root of four minus x squared All right so the idea is that if you have one of these matrices right, the reason that this this one over root n you know you might wonder why am i multiplying by root n and then dividing by root n well it's so that this matrix has a norm one um, it's just uh, normalization so that it fits the standard statements of Wigner's semicircle law. So this is the uh, this is what this curve looks like. Right? It's, uh, one over two pi times square root of four minus x squared. And the idea is that uh, the height of the curve, the height of the circle, is the uh, probability density of the eigenvalues. So you get lots of eigenvalues near the middle. Right, and then they, they sort of peter out near the edges. You get, you get the most of them near the middle. And if you plot a histogram of these things, you will get a, in the limit, you get a semicircle. Um, 
That's the that's the statement. I'm not going to be precise about it. That's the statement of the Bigner semi-simple law. It says that the, essentially uh, any IID symmetric matrix, real symmetric matrix, has its eigenvalues uh, distributed this way, not just plus minus one, but actually a huge class of matrices. Um, even like if their entries are Gaussian distributed and things like that. So that's the Wigner sem semicircle law. And um, okay, so that should give us a way to compute approximately at least these new Ks. And then that gives us, by virtue of this expression, the lambda Ks. And then we can add them up and see how it compares to number of edges, which is n choose two plus k plus one choose two. So that's kind of a game plan. Um, so, uh, uh, by the way, to do that, you need to know where the new Ks are with quite a bit of precision. So it's not enough to know just the semicircle law and it's sort of classical formulation, which is a, it's a limit theorem. Uh, it says that the, essentially that the number of eigenvalues up to a certain point, uh, you can mark an X here on the line up to a certain, it's just, it equals the, you know, the fraction of eigenvalues to the left of the value x is the integral under this uh, uh, semicircle. Um, there's a local limit law version of that that's known, uh, and quite a bit is known about these. The spacing between the eigenvalues a lot is known. Um, so this is this is precise. This is true in a very precise sense. So the the uh, the location of the eigenvalues is sort of exactly what you would expect from this this picture that I just drew. Um, uh, of course, they're random, but uh, you can put the eigenvalues in a very small window. And um, okay, so actually, what, where is the kth eigenvalue? That you might wonder, you know, given this picture, where, where does the kth eigenvalue fall? Um, well, the alpha nth eigenvalue. So to think of alpha as varying from zero to one, right? So we have the, the first eigenvalue when alpha is one over n. Think of it as zero, all the way up to when alpha is one, right? Of course, the, the subscript is supposed to be an integer, but we're going to pretend like it isn't for the moment. When does this happen? When when is lambda? Actually, that should be mu. Um, when is new alpha n equal to to some value t? Well, it's when I should say approximately because of the, the local limit theorem only gives you a little window that it's inside of. It'll be true, that'll be true that new alpha n will be about t if, well, the integral from t up to 2 of, let's call this function rho of x, of rho of x, x is alpha, right? If you, you want an alpha fraction of the eigenvalues, well, you have to integrate up to the point where you get an alpha fraction of the area under the curve. Um, and notice, by the way, I'm, I'm indexing backwards, right? I'm indexing from right to left. So um, that's why the, uh, this is inter integrating from t up to 2 instead of from uh, negative 1 up to, or negative 2 up to t. Um, that's the only reason that that's happening. So, okay, if we call this function, this integral, call it, let's say, f of t then what we're really saying is that new alpha n will be about uh, f inverse of alpha. Okay, so we've got our, this is rho. And then, so what does f look like? So f of t is the integral from t up to, um, up to two of rho. So if you integrate, this function, um, you get uh, uh, you get uh, this is one, and we're gonna go from negative two to two. Uh, it looks like this, and that's terrible. Um, should be symmetric. There we go. Um, right, so all the eigenvalues are greater than equal to negative two, and none of them are greater than equal to two. That's, that's what this integral looks like. This is your f. And then, right, we said that new alpha n is, well, it's about f inverse of alpha. 
And so what does F inverse look like? Well, okay, draw that. So more than that. Um, if you draw F inverse, okay, that looks like this. Think about it for a minute. This is our graph of F inverse. And it's going from zero to one and negative two to two. That's the graph of F inverse. And um, okay, so what does the sum of the <coughs> eigenvalues look like as you go from one up to uh, alpha n? I think I think of k as being a multiple of n, so half of n, a third of n, or two thirds of n, etc. Um, well, you're going to get uh, remember the lambda k is n plus root n times nu k. So you get an n for each one of these lambdas. So it's n times alpha n. And then you pick up something from the new n's. Namely, you get n to the three halves because the root n gives you a factor of n to the one half. And then there's a factor of n because I'm rescaling everything from zero up to one. Notice I, I wrote it up to one here instead of uh, up to n. So the rescaling gives you another factor of n. And then it's just the integral under this curve now. So this is the integral from uh, zero to alpha of f inverse of x dx. Um, and if you plot that, um, it looks like this. Right, think about think about integrating this. You integrate the whole thing, you get zero because the it's symmetric about a half, um, and so that's why it comes back to zero over here. But uh, this curve is concave down, and it's uh, it's positive, and this is just the integral of f inverse. Um, this is a plot of the integral of f inverse. So okay, so that means that. Um, we should expect here that the uh, the, the alpha nth eigenvalue looks like this, right? So it's alpha n squared plus n to the three halves integral from zero to alpha f inverse of x dx. And so um, now you can see in that that picture that I drew where there is this line from the complete graph and then a, a parabola from the upper bound in the Brouwer conjecture. If you add something to that line which is positive and concave down, it will do something like this and cross the upper bound. But it'll cross the upper bound near the end because this term is really small compared to this term. It's really uh, in, in a much, much lower order. So you really should see this crossing of the bound much, much closer to the end, your end. And indeed, uh, you know, so what's the, what's the upper bound, you know, m plus k plus one choose two, this is, well, it's, you know, n squared over two is m is n choose two, and then plus, okay, if, uh, uh, if, if uh, we have alpha, then it's, you know, alpha m squared over two about, and so you get what, you get n squared over two, and one plus alpha squared, right, or if you write beta to be one minus alpha, so that we're starting from the, the, the end instead of starting from the beginning, then you get that m plus k plus one choose two is about uh, n squared over two plus n times one minus beta squared over two, which is n squared one minus beta. You get n squared from both of the terms and then a n beta times two all over two, so that's where the n squared beta comes from. And then uh, as a lower order term, n squared beta squared over two. And so, okay, so I wanna consider both of these expressions because we wanna compare these two, so that expression and that expression, if we take beta to be about one over root n. So we're getting really close to the end, it's not quite, Zero, zero would be all the way at the end. One over root n is close. Um, well, in that case, the this expression, I'm really running out of room on it. Uh, so, right here. 
this expression is what? It's about uh, n squared one minus beta plus mm, some constant times n, right? Because uh, we're getting alpha is about uh, one over root n, and we're integrating something uh, that's, you know, uh, uh, just some some positive value that you, you just replace it with a, the average value on that interval. Um, it's about we're getting some. It's about one over root n because this distance is one over root n right here. That's what beta is chosen to be, and so you get one over root n times n to the three half. That gives you a, a linear term, right? But if you compare it to the the other term, what do you get? So this the second term is uh, n squared one minus beta, I'm gonna leave that as it is. And then the second term is, well, beta squared is now one over n, one over n times n is, uh, times n squared is also linear. So you get some other constant, c prime times n. So you see it's, it's very delicate because now we're just comparing these two uh, linear terms. And yeah, it turns out because of this convexity, this, the idea that this, this thing is, is actually, it's positive, it's concave down, um, it turns out this C here is, uh, is three halves. Um, yeah, three halves. Whereas this C prime is one half. Uh, one half? No, no, it's, uh, it's one. And so uh, the upper bound, this, the upper bound is exceeded by, well, the thing that was supposed to be an upper bound is exceeded by the left-hand side by about n over two. Um, and I don't know if that's optimal, but it's, it's fairly close. Uh, and so, yeah, so the, that implies, right, that the average, the average case, or almost all signings of a complete graph, the sum of the Laplacian eigenvalues uh, the signed Laplacian eigenvalues exceeds the Brouwer bound when uh, k is very close to n, namely it's, a, it's about root n less than than n, and, uh, and so the most most signings actually violate the, the Brouwer condition. And just a comment: I, I think that's not true of almost all graphs because. Uh, a random graph is quite far from violating the Brouwer conjecture. They, they all satisfy the Brouwer conjecture. But maybe it's true for random signings of threshold graphs. I'm not sure. Uh, it was essentially it was easy to show it for, not easy, but it was just this calculation to show it for uh, a complete graph because all the degrees are the same. Right? So they have very tight control over the, the form of the Laplacian. But for other threshold graphs, it may not be the case. So one, one question, follow-up question is, is this true? Is it true that the Brouwer conjecture fails, the signed Brouwer conjecture fails for random signings of Brouwer of, uh, of, um, um, of threshold graphs, not just the uh, complete graph? And with that, I'll end, I'll end there. Any questions? Thanks, Josh. Maybe uh, everybody turn their mics on and saying thanks would be too much or claps or something, but maybe some thank yous in the chat would be would be nice for Josh. You're welcome. Okay. Uh, if anybody has any questions, go ahead and uh, we'll open it up. Are we going to get cut off at 3.30? Uh, I don't know. Lincoln, do you know whether this will just uh, shut us We're off? we to find out. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. I think to, at light, no other sections are coming up. So we should be, can be like a, longer. It's no problem. Yeah, it's a question of whether it's simply impolite to stay on or whether we're actually going to get booted. Yeah, well, we, we, we scheduled this seminar. We, uh, some buffer between you know, the, the session and the other session. So, mm. in the case of somebody spent longer than one hour, it should be okay. All right. Well, if nobody has any questions, um, I, I did. Um, yeah. 
A lot of the classes of graphs you mentioned up front that satisfy the um, Brouwer conjecture, I think are also distinguished by low dimensional Weissweiler Lehmann for graphs, for graph isomorphism. Mm. And in particular, two dimensional Weissweiler Lehmann um, distinguishes um, non cospectral graphs. So the eigenvalues are determined by two dimensional Weissweiler Lehmann. I'm wondering if there are any combinatorial properties that are picked up by two or three dimensional Weissweiler Lehmann. Um, that would be useful in informing us about why these graphs do um, satisfy the Brouwer conjecture and what, what could we possibly leverage um, and generalize from that? Hmm. Yeah, I don't, so I know virtually nothing about the theory you're referring to. Um, but uh, interesting, yeah, I guess I mean, somehow the, you know, it's the split graphs that are uh, and, and also threshold graphs more specifically are the most dangerous, right? They're the ones that, the things that close to, come close to split graphs are the only graphs that you can use. Um, so I wonder if you can, what, what, is, what does split graphs look like from that perspective? Or, or things that are nearly split. It's kind of a regime where the danger territory Do we have any other questions? Let me give Chad a second to back out some questions if we have anything. Otherwise, we'll go ahead and uh, close it out here. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. This went amazingly smoothly under the circumstances. So I guess we'll have another one next week. Yep. Excellent. Okay. Thanks again, so Josh. Have a good, have a good weekend.